this one. Hey, I should put this one up. There, that looks more professional. Hey, Tort. Trying to figure out where my video was. Oh, are you there? I'm I here. You. I see you, you see in the, I, I in the see you in the semi-dark. Okay, good. That's good. Hey, Gavin, how are you? Hi, I'm back? Gavin. No, hey, nice this is brand, brand new. Um, yeah, hi, are Randy. I, no, I'm in, in London, in England. Ah, well, I was married there in 1976. Oh, really? Did you enjoy it? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not talking about the marriage. I was talking about London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a bit of an Anglophile, to be honest with you. Uh, it's a couple of times I went over there. In the uh, early 70s, I was a, a roadie, like a rock and roll roadie for a, a UK band. And uh, that's when that's I cool. first, yeah, when I first saw London, I went to Piccadilly Circus and I, you know, saw all the machines right. and, and all the arcades there. But, uh, and then subsequently I got in the amusement industry and I went back there and I, I lived there for uh, close to a year. Um, and I worked for a company, you're too young to remember, a company called <laughs> Ruffler and Deeth Limited. Hey, yeah, I don't, I don't remember that one. I think it yeah. probably was before my time. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it was. Uh, so, uh, so when did you say it was that 70s, did you say? Yeah, I was. Uh, that was 1975 and 1976. That I was yeah, there. the hot summer of 76, yeah. And, w w and what's really interesting <laughs> is, I'm not sure if you know what Reddit is, but there's this website, chat message board thing called reddit r-e-d-d-i-t and uh, i had posted something on the electronic board as a re reply to somebody and i got a response from somebody who said hey i think i know you were you <laughs> were you in london in the 70s and i went yeah man i was and <laughs> and so we sort of reconnected which which is really interesting he's not he's not in the amusement industry anymore but uh, so that so that was cool. So so uh, hey, a, a ni nice to meet you, uh, Gavin. And let me say hello to Hi. Jeff Jeff Sonic, uh, whom I also do not know. Jeff, are you there? I guess not. Sean, are you there? Oh, I got to admit you. Okay. Oh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on with Jeff. Um. Uh. uh so. Uh, um, uh, getting back to you, Gavin, uh, are you you uh, a game collector or what? Yeah, I'm. I'm just an enthusiast about everything, really. Um, I have a a knowledge of electronics from a kid. Um, I actually currently work in software, but I still I still do sort of hardware things. I, I um, see you know the calculus. Uh, do you have a degree? Uh, yeah I, yeah, I do have a degree. I have a degree in natural sciences, which oh. is uh, maths and physics and various other things. Ah, great. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a geek like that. Awesome. Um, well, hey, we, we all are. George, yeah. wouldn't you say that we all are, Sean? Wouldn't you say that we all are pretty much? Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, Sean, nice <laughs> to see you. <laughs> um, in terms of collecting, not, not really, but I... I bought myself an arcade cocktail table about four years ago, um, and I've recently bought another one, and I haven't uh, fixed either of them yet. But the one that I have just um, just bought came in a completely non-working condition, um, and the monitor didn't work. The guy I bought it from said it didn't work, and I should just replace it. And I thought that uh, that's not what I want to do. I want to fix this. I. I fixing it actually matters more than playing the game absolutely for me that's totally <laughs> because i'm not a player at all i do i just don't play but i love the electronics in, in uh, amusement games i just love it uh, i haven't touched monitors well I, actually as a kid we used to go to the local dump and pick up old tvs they were like the transition from valve to solid state so i used to tinker Valves, with long... for those of you in america meaning vacuum tubes vacuum so tubes know. right vacuum <laughs> tubes yeah um yeah so i haven't done anything with monitors the only thing i know about monitors is watching your videos from tech fest i think it was um so yeah so i know i know nothing but so that's why i'm here ah super these uh, cocktail table games you have are these taito cocktail tables from japan uh, they are sh shui which is a japanese um a japanese brand that nobody wants to collect which makes them nice and cheap i'm quite happy with that 
You know, as far as I'm concerned, a monitor, especially a monochrome monitor, which is what you're talking about, is a monitor. Oh, no, they, they're, they're color. A, are they really? Yeah. What? Yeah. So it's it's a it's a Mashuista, which is I think the Matsushita. same as yeah yeah um, same as Nintendo perhaps at the time. I'm not quite sure. 14 inch color monitor. Hey, hey, John, do you have some input in this regard? I see you popping up here. No, he's just saying hi. Oh, no audio, John. Sorry. <laughs> do, do, uh, did you say Matsushita? Matsushita, yeah. yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, all those Japanese companies were like in cahoots with one another. Matsushita. Hey. Hi, Stones. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Hey, well, welcome, welcome. And so it's evening for you. And, um, and welcome. And uh, hey, Sean, the right how are day you? This time. How, how, yeah, thank, yeah, good, good deal. So, Sean, how are you, buddy? I'm very well, thank you. You? Thank you. Good. I'm fine. Thanks, John. Are you okay? Cool. Yeah, doing well, Randy. Thank you. Yeah. Staying safe. Glad, glad to see you. Uh, gee, where's Paul? I can't believe he has. Yeah, where is Paul? Here. I'm right here. <laughs> are you here? I'm here. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's funny. We have a kind of a, we have an old, we have an R gang now, sort of, uh, which isn't what I had expected. When I first started this, I thought, oh, we're going to have dozens of different people and they're going to be tuning in. And it's, it's mostly just us uh, with, with Gavin. So thanks, Gavin, <laughs> for coming along. Um, okay. Um, so, um, Uh, you know what, John? I'm just going to make you the the host, if you don't mind. I'll do that right now. Uh, let me see how I do that. Yeah, not a problem, Randy. I can't remember how to do it. Frickin' frackin' frickin'. Uh... I think if you go to participants and you check on, it'll show who's the host. You can just change it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. More. Uh, make host. That's you. All right, great. Um, groovy. Uh, um, so, uh, as some of you may have read, I got a couple of requests, one of which was a discussion about ground and what the heck is the deal with ground, which I think is interesting. Another person had a request where they really wanted to do some live troubleshooting. Is that person here? I don't know who you are. You had a monitor and you said, let's do it on like live and troubleshoot. Um, well, so, some of that was me. Um, okay. I've got one of these. We could have a look at that. Um, it was like testing transistors and such, wasn't it? Yeah. That, that was you. That's right. That's and right. the the other question, if we have time, is, um, you know, how do you approach something who's, well, given that you know nothing, uh, that is blowing its fuses, how do you approach that? Oh, yes, yes. And, and yeah, and that's an excellent topic it's just an excellent topic super easy for somebody like uh john who's with us or paul who's with us they know these things perhaps george as well although honestly george i'm not familiar with your with your skill set uh, to be honest with you to at all um uh, and i'm not asking you to tell me right now i'm just saying don't know um so uh it, does anybody have, else have any more comments before I sort of launch into this discussion of what ground is? Uh, I have a suggestion for today as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually uh, working on a K7000 right now as we speak. It's live on uh, my testing rig. Um, I'm troubleshooting a color circuit. If we have time, I could uh, we could walk everybody through how to troubleshoot the color circuits. Mm. Mm. If anybody's interested. Well, yeah, that's you know, always a fun and easy thing to do. So, uh, I, you know, I'm wondering if um, if we do that, if I shouldn't start with like the G07, which has all discrete components, and then move on to the K7000, which has the LM1203 or whatever the heck it is. That's the no, it's a tw not a 1203. What the? No, what? I didn't have that. It's a UPC 1397. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So. Um, so we can do that. So, um, but you know, the question about ground, I thought is really interesting. And if you don't know anything about what ground is, it, this might work out okay. 
if you, if you don't have any objections, I think I'll just lead off with that. Is that is is anybody does anyone have a, an objection to that? Sounds good. All righty then. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Well, let's see. I think this thing starts recording automatically. John, can you see? Is it recording? Yes, it is. Okay. Never mind. Yeah, recording. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so, if you don't mind, and I <clears throat> guess even if you do, uh, let's talk for just a little bit about something known as ground. Uh, so this is one of the requests that I got that said, hey, what's the deal with ground? And this request came in really a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but last week we ended up with vertical deflection. And so let's talk just a little bit about ground. So ground in the world of electronics is our zero volt reference point. Ground is kind of like, if you imagine like a, a a pilot and he's flying around and he has to call his altitude in to an air traffic controller. He doesn't give his altitude above the actual earth because he'll be flying over mountains and valleys and things like that. He uses sea level as a reference. When you're calling in your altitude to an air traffic controller, you give him your altitude above sea level. It doesn't matter what your what's called the absolute altitude is, your altitude above the ground. We want, all want to have the same reference. So that's kind of what ground is. Ground is our zero volt reference point. When we make, for example, voltage measurements, we make them with respect to ground. Um, voltage itself is actually defined as the, forgive me, the potential difference between two points. By potential, we mean the amount of charge. So you can't actually measure voltage at one point. That's not the definition of voltage. The vo definition of voltage is the difference in pressure, because remember, voltage is pressure or potential between two different points. And in general, almost without exception, but there, there are plenty of exceptions, that reference point is something that we refer to as ground. Ground is our zero volt reference point, just like sea level is zero feet. You could have, you could be in Death Valley, California, where it's 200 feet below sea level, or you could be above sea level in the mountains, blah, 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 blah. Sea level is your reference. So there are actually two different kinds of ground that we're going to be discussing. The first type that I'd like to discuss is something known as earth ground. It's called earth ground. And as the, and, and in UK and in uh, Oz and uh, lots of other places in the world, um, they don't use the term ground, they use the term earth. So uh, for example, in the United States, when we say, hey, let's ground something, they would say, let's earth something. So this first kind of, of ground that I'm going to talk about is something that we refer to in North America as earth ground, but in UK and I think in Australia and I think also in uh, Africa, they would refer to this as earth earth, which seems perfectly redundant, doesn't it? But that's what it's called, earth earth. So uh, as the name implies, earth ground or earth earth is physically connected to the planet it is physically connected to the earth itself the earth itself the actual planet is our zero volt reference point so so um we have a symbol for earth ground that we use on schematic diagrams i'm sure you know it and it's this 
it's three lines of diminishing width that form a kind of an arrow that's always pointing down toward the bottom of the schematic diagram as if it was you know, pointing to the, the actual earth itself. Now, sometimes you will see a kind of a shorthand version of this. Uh, you may see the earth ground drawn like this, just a triangle, but it still points down toward the earth itself. So this is called the earth ground, and it is actually connected to the earth itself. I'm going to use the United, the, the North American power system as my demonstration, but elsewhere in the world, this is, is real similar. So here in Murica, the way our power distribution system works is that there are two slots and then kind of a half round slot. That's kind of different than Europe. In, in, Euro, in, in lots of Europe, there are two round pins and you have no idea which one's hot and neutral. And the earth ground or the earth earth is there and there, two metal, metal contacts. And when you plug the plug in, it, it connects with them. In UK, they have a what they call the 13 amp plug. And in UK, it's massive. It's really an awesome plug. And um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think yeah. that two, in, two, two little rectangles now. Yeah, yeah, they're equal in, in size, though, are they not? Yeah, they're da da down a bit. You have the big, big earth one at the top and the two little rectangles down at down at um, five o'clock and uh, eight, seven o'clock. OK, well, you know what? If you Look up the 13 amp UK <laughs> UK plug yeah. and you'll you'll see what it is and I should be familiar with it and I'm embarrassed that I'm not. Anyway, so in, in United States of America and, and Canada and similar Caribbean, um, the short slot is what's what we refer to as the hot side of the AC power, as you probably know. Here in America, it is where you connect the black wire which kind of seems counterintuitive. You wouldn't think that the hot side would be black, but here in America, it is, there's a, there's a semi-logical reason for that that I may or may not get into later on. But that's where here in the United States, the 120 volts AC is. And of course, elsewhere in the, in the world, it's 220 or, or 240. Um, uh, anyway, so that's, that's the hot side of the AC power. The opposite side, the long uh, slot, is what we refer to as neutral, N-E-U-T-R-A-L, and that is zero volts. That is what we refer to as our return path, the return path for the AC current. And this is zero volts. In other words, there is only one slot that the juice comes out of, and that's the short slot, the hot side. The neutral side right here is zero volts. It is, is, it is where we would connect the white wire if we were connecting an AC power plug. And by the way, in, in Europe, everywhere else in the world except stupid North America, the hot side is brown, uh, brown, and the neutral side is blue, which makes it much easier to remember be because blue, think of blue as a cool, it's like a cool color, isn't it? It's like water, it's cold, it's, it's not hot, it's not active, it's cool, it's blue, it's neutral. Uh, and the other side is brown. And they made it brown instead of red because red, as you know, we use for direct current. The red wire typically has some sort of positive DC on it. So anyway, so, so we have the, the hot side and the neutral, and then getting back to our discussion here of ground, which is what we're really talking about, this sort of half round pin here in the United States, and again, in, in other places in Europe, it's here and here, or wherever the heck it is on the 13 amp UK plug. Um, this is what we refer to as the earth ground or earth earth, if you will. And it's called that because it is physically connected to the earth somehow. This wire is either connected to a cold water pipe that is buried in the ground, or it might be connected to an actual rod or a stake that is driven into the ground, which is the ground stake. Um, 
uh, and you see this uh, periodically, for example, just to give you a, a little example, the home that I live in right now, this home that you're looking at right here, was built in 1956. And when it was built, it just had a two wire system. It was not grounded at all. When I moved in, I elected to call an electrician because I'm not doing this myself and have him reinstall the electric power so that I have grounded outlets everywhere, which is you know, what, what, what I really wanted. And to get that ground, I guess I could walk outside and show it to you, I, I won't. Uh, it is an, an actual like a copper rod that's like about this long, uh, about this, lo this long <laughs> that is driven right into the ground really close to the breaker panel, the circuit breaker panel. And there's a very thick wire, like a number zero wire or something that, that connects the ground up to the breaker panel itself. It, it's, it's nice to know, it's not germane to this discussion necessarily, but it is nice to know that here in America and I'm guessing elsewhere in the world, the earth ground and the neutral are both connected together at the breaker panel. At the circuit breaker panel, the fuse box, if you want to call it that, but they're not fuses, of course. Um, those two wires are connected together. So the earth ground, which, by the way, is green or it might be green with a yellow stripe, um, is, and neutral are, are, are sort of one and the same. However, and this is really important, the neutral is the return path for the electric current. If you don't quite know what I mean by return path, ugh, it's not the point of this discussion. One of these days we, we might talk about it, uh, how a complete circuit requires a return path for electric current. Um, so, so the neutral side is the return path for the electric current and that goes to the electronics inside. The ground is connected to the outside of everything that is grounded. That is to say, if you had a drill motor that had the third pin on it, the grounded pin, the outside of the drill motor would be connected to ground. Uh, in a video game, everything that is metal on the outside of the machine in United States law anyway, has to be grounded to an earth ground. And that, that, that goes all the way down to the actual carriage bolts. Like if you have a carriage bolt holding the control panel down, the heads of the carriage bolts, if they're exposed and they're metal, technically they are supposed to be grounded. At, at one point, I, I found this very interesting, not to digress, I will a little bit. At one point I was asked to do a, a bit of export work to Russia. Uh, there, there was a, just a huge amount of games that we had, and they were stationed in New York, um, upstate New York, and Poughkeepsie, New York. And uh, these were going to be exported to Russia, but in order to do that, they had to, number one, work on 220, so I had to modify them so that they were usable on 220. But number two, they had to pass this universal safety inspection or whatever it was and i had to ground literally everything with you know crimp to, crimp lugs and grounds and you know running wires down to some kind of an earth ground so so the point that i'm making here just to come bring you back is that the outside of everything really including amusement games the the rails of a pinball are to be grounded to earth ground for safety reasons that's that that connection. The neutral is connected to the outside of the, I'm sorry, the, the inside where the, the electronics is. However, they are both connected together at the breaker panel, wherever that is. And I'm assuming that it's the same everywhere in the world. So that's what we refer to as earth ground or earth earth. But in a monitor, in, in many monitors that we use in the amusement industry and many other things, we don't use the earth ground. There is another kind of ground that we refer to as a chassis ground. It's called the chassis ground, or I'm guessing in UK, you'd call it the, the chassis earth, I suppose. 
And its schematic symbol looks like this. There's only one of them. It kind of looks like a chicken foot to me, but you know, it's not exactly. Anyway, that's that's the schematic symbol for chassis ground. So chassis ground is also zero volts. It's a common zero volt reference point. It just doesn't happen to be touching the earth itself. For example, in an automobile. In an automobile, you have an elect electrical system, but it's the car's up on four rubber tires and rubber's an insulator. So even though there is a common return path for all the electronics, a common zero volt point, it's not touching the earth itself because the car's up on four rubber tires. So in an automobile or in an aircraft or, or uh, in like a freshwater boat, the ground is not an earth ground connected to the earth itself. It's this thing that we refer to as a chassis ground. Now, if, you, if you're a ship plying the Atlantic and you're in salt water, you can get an earth ground. Salt water conducts electricity, like as you probably know, like crazy. And all you have to do is drop, well, you don't have to drop anything into the water because the hull is in the water. That is your earth ground not a problem. But in fresh water, it's a bit different. Um, and I, I don't mean to digress, but a lot of people think that water conducts electricity, but in fact, pure water does not. Pure, not, not very well anyway. Pure, like distilled water, it's, it's bipolar. It, it barely conducts at all. But if you add a little salt to it or some base or a acid or something like that, then it does conduct electricity. So, so anyway, so, so a chassis ground is like where it's a common zero volt point, but it's not actually touching the earth itself. And in our monitors, this is a super important consideration. So before I move further, I want you to, I, I want you to just step back and cognize something here. And that is, this is really important that the neutral and the earth ground are connected together here at the breaker panel. They are one and the same electrical point. And then we also have this other thing called chassis ground, which isn't connected to the earth at all, but this is the type of ground that we use in our older monitors, such as the K7000, the 4900, the 4600, the G07, the, of, you know, games of that era, monitors of that era, all monitors that do not have the switch mode power supply, which we'll get to in just a little bit. The switch mode power supply monitors you can recognize because they have the yellow, little yellow transformer as part of the power supply. And, and it's really obvious that it's a switch mode. So we'll get to that in just a second. So uh, let me just stop here for just a second. Does anybody have any questions so far about this issue with what ground actually is? Oh, I'm good. Five, four, three, two, one, everybody okay? Cool, no question. all right, all right. Sorry, question? No question. Okay, awesome, all right. So, uh, so here's the deal. Let me think how the best way to express this here. The question was raised about the difference between this chassis ground and the earth ground and all these different grounds. And specifically, they we're talking about the video ground. So let's take uh, uh, just a minute to look at the video input, let's say, of kind of a, a, a standard monitor. So if you look at this, like we don't even care about what's called negative sync. We, we really don't. Let's just look at the positive sync one. So here's a six pin connector. Here's pins one, two, three, four, five, six. And as you know, pin one is the red video input. And I would grab colored pens, but you, you know what's going on. So uh, pin number two is the green video input. Pin number three is the blue video input. And as you know, these are just changing voltages. The higher the voltage, the more of that color appears on the screen. And that's not the point of our discussion, but I mean, that's the deal. So in this era of monitors that we're talking about, typically it's, typically it's around one volt to around four volts or so. 
we don't really have a standard. Uh, you may even consider this something between zero volts and five volts, and you would not be wrong necessarily in considering that. The higher the voltage is, the more that color appears on the screen. So for example, if, so, if, if the computer from the game wants something to appear red on the screen, it might put out maybe four volts out this red output of the board into the red input of the monitor, and we'd see you know, red on the screen. If it wanted to be red, but maybe not quite so bright, it might put out only two volts. In other words, the, the higher the voltage, the brighter that color is. And that's not the point of our discussion, really. So, so these are the three red, green, and blue inputs. And then pin number four, which is, for those of you that really want to talk about it, the same as pin number one of the three pin connector is, uh, is ground. So this ground is the chassis ground. So here's the deal. It's a chassis, C-H-A-S-S-I-S. -S -S. Here's the deal. That is a chassis ground. This monitor is what we refer to as a hot chassis monitor. It's called a hot chassis monitor. And these are extremely common. They were extremely common, especially um, for consumer televisions. If you've ever looked carefully at the plastic shell of a consumer TV, you know that every single one of them on the back says, caution, no user serviceable parts inside. Do not open this fricking shell and touch anything. And that's because if you were personally grounded and you touch the metal chassis of the monitor, you would shock the snot out of yourself because there'd be half of the AC line is there, uh, either 110 or 220, you know, 120 or, or 220, depending on what you sent to the monitor, and, and you'd shock the heck out of yourself. So these are called hot chassis monitors. And this is why they have to be powered by an isolation transformer. We covered this actually in a previous uh, CRT workshop, but I'll, I'll just mention it in just a second. We're going to get back to this chassis ground thing in just a second. Um, but let me go to why you need this isolation transformer. We'll get to that and just we'll get back to that in just a second here. But here's the deal. The way the AC power works, the way the power supply works in, a, in, in any of these monitors is that the AC power comes in and it'll go through a fuse. That's a schematic symbol for a fuse. I've drawn an American you know, power thingy. Let's call that hot and let's call that neutral. And then it goes to the bridge rectifier. The first thing it really goes to is the bridge, the first active thing it goes to is the bridge rectifier. So here's the bridge rectifier, which you know is made out of four diodes. It can be four individual diodes or a single one piece bridge, depending on the monitor. And here's the positive output. And this goes somewhere that we don't care about at the moment. Here is the negative output of the bridge where the two anodes are tied together. The unstripe, the end without the stripe on it, without the bar on it, is called the anode, A-N-O-D-E. And where these two anodes are connected together, that's the negative output of the bridge rectifier, and it is connected to the chassis. It is connected to the metal chassis itself. If you're touching the metal chassis of the monitor, you are touching this point right here where these two anodes are connected together. Well, as you know, there is an external earth ground, which is normally connected to the chassis of the monitor. You know, it's a green wire with a little clip on it. And you, you just shove it on the, the monitor chassis somewhere to ground the chassis, right? But here's the deal. The neutral side here, the neutral side of the AC power right here, is also connected to the earth ground. Do you remember that? We just talked about that. It's connected at the breaker panel to the earth ground. These two points are connected together. Therefore, if you were to plug this right into the AC power without this thing called an isolation transformer, which I'm, I'm sure you all know about, 
This diode is dead shorted now. It's shorted by virtue of the fact that the earth ground and the, and the chassis ground, they're, they're connected together. That, that is to say, sorry, the neutral, which is connected to the earth ground and the grounded chassis, you have also put an earth ground on the metal chassis, haven't you, with that extra wire there. So this diode is now dead short. The diode itself is good, but you've completely bypassed it with wires, basically. And that blows up the, the bridge rectifier. What it will do, without a doubt, if you, if you plug a monitor into the AC power directly without an isolation transformer, and you ground it, without a doubt, these two diodes and the traces that connect them will be vaporized right off the board. I mean, the copper is just vaporized right off the board. And the diodes themselves are blown, and there may be other issues as well. There, yeah, there's a, a couple of bad things that can that can really super happen. So, so um, the purpose of the isolation transformer is to break that connection between neutral and earth ground, so that doesn't happen. Meaning that if for some reason you ever connected the monitor directly to the AC power and hooked it up to your grounded amusement game and your computer and all that and power supply and all that kind of stuff you sort of have a 50 you do have a 50 50 chance depending on which way the thing is connected if it's connected one way it'll work fine and you have no idea that you've come this close to screwing things up and if you reverse it it does what i talked about before it vaporizes stuff and and like and, and like that so can i ask a quick question yes there? please yes go ahead um, if I have an oscilloscope, uh, do I have to make sure that's on the isolation transformer side? Ooh, yeah. So this is real. Do you have an oscilloscope? I do, I do and I don't want to fry it. Okay, because this is what I did. I vaporized the ground connection right off my scope probe. The first time I started working on this stuff, I had no idea what you could or couldn't do. So, uh, so here's the deal. The scope is always connected directly to the AC power without the isolation transformer. And the monitor has to be connected to an isolation transformer. If you don't, as soon as you connect the ground probe, the alligator clip, the ground of your, of your oscilloscope probe and turn it on, right. it, it blows up and you will have to change your underwear. I mean, right. it's really, <laughs> it, it vaporizes stuff with... I don't know, a hundred thousand joules of energy. I don't know. It just got, it yeah. just blows, blows the heck up. I don't know. Paul Jury, have you ever done this to yourself or gone? Uh, I've never uh, done that, but I've seen the results of uh, what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> oh, you've seen the two negative going diodes in the bridge gone yep. and the, the traces the vaporized. Traces. Yep. Yeah. Then you know what happened, right? So I know what not to do. What, what do you do though? Well, as I said, the monitor itself is connected to the isolation transformer and then powered up, and okay. then and the and the scope itself is powered right from the mains. Uh, right for those from the United States of America, the mains is what they call the main AC power, what we call the 120 volt AC. They, yeah. they refer to it as the mains. Uh, uh, the scope is plugged plugged directly into the mains, and then you're cool. You can ground the scope right to the metal chassis. You can probe anything you want. It's not an issue whatsoever. Okay. Okay. So you're cool. All right. So, so uh, again, uh, the question was this deal about uh, ground and and why some grounds are different and 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 the uh, I think the discussion uh, the question was mostly about noise and electrical noise and and grounding and, and and stuff like that and what's the difference between the two. So here's the deal. So let me go back to my little illustration here with uh, pins one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, remember R, G, B, and ground, right? We don't care about the sinks. The sinks are, you know, minus vertical, minus, oops, plus vertical, and plus horizontal sinks. We don't, we don't care about those things. We just really care about this. So, so this is a chassis ground. And if you were to turn off the monitor, and use your meter on like continuity tester 
and check between this pin, the ground, and the metal chassis, you would absolutely have continuity. And you go, why do I have two different grounds? And it has to do with the amount of current that is traveling on the ground. And here's the important concept. When you think of ground as being zero volts and anything that's connected to ground, whether it's an earth ground or a chassis ground, that's going to be zero volts. The, the theoretical ground, you're absolutely correct. It is zero volts. However, in the real world, almost everything has resistance. Uh, unless you are dealing with a superconductor that's at like minus uh, 200 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, really everything has some resistance. So there's actually a big difference between power ground and signal ground. In a power ground situation, for example, let's talk about the, uh, the JAMA connector, I guess. Uh, you know, so the JAMA connector, you got you got power and you got ground and stuff like that. We don't care about the, what the other pins are. And there's a power supply here. Let me just draw a power supply. And let's call this one ground and this one plus five volts DC, right? So the five volts DC, you know, is connected to the game. The ground is the return path, but there is a fair amount of current flowing on these wires, current measured in amperes flowing on these wires. You know, if the, if the, if the game board draws three amps of current uh, at, 50, at five volts, which is only 15 watts, it's not very much, um, you know, that's three amps of current flowing through the circuit. And any electrical noise that's on this power supply will be reflected in this circuit. In other words, there's a thing called Ohm's law. You've probably heard of it. I'm guessing you have uh, named after a guy named George Simon Ohm. And Ohm's law describes the relationship between voltage and current and resistance. Well, what Ohm's law says is that the voltage dropped across something is equal to the amount of current, which we abbreviate with the letter I, multiplied by the resistance, uh, V equals I times R. So when we have some resistance, we develop a voltage. If, if you try to run current through across any resistance, even a tiny fraction of an ohm, you develop a voltage there. So on this power line, you would love this to be 100% perfect with no electrical noise, but it's not, especially if it's a switch mode power supply, they're inherently very noisy. So there's actually a whole bunch of electrical kind of interference that's traveling on this ground wire. You go, you think to yourself, if you don't know better, oh, ground is ground, it's zero. No, nope, it can be nothing on ground, ground is zero. But that's completely not true. And in fact, at one time in my life, I was a roadie, uh, like a rock and roll roadie doing like sound augmentation and concerts and you know, and stuff like that. And we had a big giant issue with what we refer to as the ground loop, where you had a bunch of stuff grounded together, but these were some Fender twin reverb guitar amplifiers plugged in. And then you have a, 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 an audio mixer board plugged in over here and something else plugged in over here. And they all have different power supplies, but they all share the same ground. And there's a crap ton of noise traveling on this ground. And in the video, in the audio world, it makes hum. It makes mm, hum. So it's either humming because it has a ground loop, or maybe it's humming because it doesn't know the words of the song you're playing. Tip your waitress. But um, but uh, in this case, it's in the video circuit. So pin this pin pin four here is the mm -hmm. video ground, but it is a completely different ground than the power ground. Mm -hmm. If you were to, and this goes to mm -hmm. Uh, what is the video ground pin on the JAMA connector? I can't remember what the video ground pin, if anybody remembers. Wasn't that. it in the middle? Like 20, it's right in the middle. 26. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, it'd be half what? of that, probably 13, maybe. What? I don't know. Anyway, um, the video ground comes out of right in the middle of the JAMA connector for an important reason, 
we want to keep this away from the power ground. The power ground will have this kind of weird noise on it. But this video ground, since it's just the, the red, green, and blue signals coming in and the return path, the video return path doesn't have this electrical noise on it. So even though if you were to turn the monitor off and measure, con or even if it's on, and measure continuity between pin four of the six pin input or pin one of the three pin uh, connector um, and the power ground right here, you would definitely have continuity. And I've sure seen plenty of times where somebody hooks up the video ground right to the ground of the power supply because they're both ground for goodness sake and why not? And you might get away with that, but you might not. And what you might see on the screen is like weird interference. Uh, what you might see is weird sort of her what we call a herringbone pattern. These weird diagonal lines that sort of drift around on the screen because it's not synchronized with the video coming in. So it just kind of drifts around. What's really weird about this, and that now as I recall, the question was about grounding the chassis to the earth ground. I don't, I don't know the answer to this question, but here's the phenomenon that I've seen, and I'll bet you've all seen this mm -hmm. as well. Sometimes you get to a monitor and it has like weird interference on it. And you look at the monitor and you go, oh, it doesn't have the earth ground on it. Let me put the earth ground on it. And you hook up the green wire to the chassis and it goes away. The problem goes away and you go, that's what it was. I'm a genius. Other times you have this weird interference and you go, oh, well, the monitor is grounded properly to earth ground. And my ground plug is good on the game. Let me try taking the ground off. And you take the ground off the monitor, the earth ground and the problem goes away. I don't, has anybody else seen this? I've seen it a bunch of times. No? no. So I can't explain why this is. I can't explain why this is. But they are two completely different grounds that appear to be continuous to the user meter to check continuity between one and the other. But in fact, they are two separate grounds, not in terms of continuity, but because of the amount of current flowing through them. The earth ground, the power ground, I should say, has the, the, a large amount of current flowing through it, which has the noise from the power supply and the video ground coming in does not, if that makes any sense. That's, that's topic number one. Does that make sense to anybody? Yep, I got video ground on pin 14 on the jammer. Pin 14, okay. Yeah, which yeah that was good. Anybody else come in the waiting room? No, I guess not, huh? It's just us. Um, so I guess that's topic number one. Uh, Randy, hey, Randy, I do have a question real quick. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So uh, on the isolation transformer, I've got one that I put my scope on all the time. Will it hurt anything to do that and keep the isolation transformer on the monitor? Uh, in general, you don't isolate the test equipment. You don't in general because, well, not even in general, you shouldn't because if it's isolated, you don't have a good earth ground, do you? Or do you? I would think it would be separated from, right? Yeah, right. yeah. No, the test equipment gets plugged right into the AC power, but just oh. to be safe for yourself, and hello, Keith, I, I don't think I know you. Uh, um, just to be safe, if you plug every single thing into an isolation transformer, you'll, you'll be in much better shape. Um, Sencor makes a really nice one. It's very expensive. It's a PR570. But any isolation transformer will really do. And, and, and please note that a variac, a variable transformer, is does not isolate. We talked about this in a previous episode of this thing. Hey, so Keith, oh, well, Keith, you're, you're new here. Uh, I don't think we Yeah, yeah, I've uh, been watching your videos. Where are you from? Tell me about your thing. Tell us about uh, it. Uh, Sacramento, California. Okay. Cali. And uh, I'm a, I like working on the poker machines, video poker machines. Really? Yeah. So in California, they have to be 25 years old or, or older. So you're working on like old Sigma pokers and stuff? 
Yeah, I did a couple of Sigmas. I had a couple of uh, Saronics. Oh, so Saronics is a whole different animal, as you know. Were you successful fixing Saronics monitors? Uh, most of what I found the problem was, was in the wiring. Oh. Got a lot of wiring issues oh. that solved the problem. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. But for those of you that have never uh, encountered a Saronics, C-E-R-O-N-I-X, brand monitor. They're used really exclusively in the uh, gaming industry, really. Um, it's a fantastically interesting CRT monitor. The guy that runs the company, his name is Don Whitaker, is a wonderful human being. And if you ever wanted to tour a monitor factory, they don't make CRTs anymore. They make LCDs. Uh, they're in Auburn, California. You can go into the factory, take a tour anytime. Uh, Keith, you could do it. You'd be, you'd be right yeah. up the street from you. I was, uh, I was talking to the guy a while back and he said they make a uh, conversion kit for the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a drop in kit for an LCD for a CRT. They're like 400 bucks or something like that. Yeah, it's a lot of money I mean, when, when you can fix a CRT for pretty cheap. But yeah. um, I personally have found Saronix monitors to be uh, difficult to work on because they're completely different than any other kind of monitor you will ever experience in your life. Fortunately, they have lots and lots of uh, uh, flow charts and test points and, and things like that. And every year I have been doing a... Uh, a presentation for the gaming industry called Tech Fest, where someone from Saronix would come and give a presentation on their CRT yeah. monitors, but now they're LCD monitors. And yeah. yeah, they're really interesting, really super. So, well, the hey, other, welcome. Yeah. The other one I've worked on are the uh, RGB. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Made in Grass Valley, California. Yeah, they are more or less the same as Saronix, but different. And if you could ever keep an RGB monitor working, well, you have my respect. I gotta <laughs> tell you, yeah, you do. You, you, they're difficult. Yeah, yeah. Those are the tools that I've really encountered so far. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, so, does anybody else, you know, uh, does anybody else have any comments? Uh, more comments? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I want to go for a full two hours today. I have some other things going on. Uh, anybody have any more comments about it? I do have one question, Randy. Yeah, yeah, Keith, go ahead. Um, no, yeah, we capped a uh, Saronix monitor. I bought a uh, Get Well kit on eBay. And when I got the new caps, I noticed they were a lot smaller than the originals that were on oh, the. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I don't know if that's is that co pretty common. Oh, it's completely normal. Um, uh, uh, co electrolytic capacitor technology has improved quite a bit in the past 20 or 30 or 40 years. And uh, with advanced etching techniques for the foil itself and more advances in electrolyte chemistry, as you've noticed, and I have Paul and everybody here will, will, get, will guarantee will back me up on this, the same size, so same electrical specification for a capacitor is now about two thirds the size, maybe yeah. even half the size that it used to be. So don't, don't worry about that. That's okay, a, that's yeah. actually a cool thing. Better than yeah. that. They should be smaller than bigger where we might not be able to fit them in. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're cool. Thanks. Hey, uh, hey, Randy. Yes, sir. Along those lines, uh, I've been noticing recently on several Hello, Anthony. Do I know you? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I joined last week for the first time oh, and hey. uh, I've been following I've been following you uh, on where, trying where to catch from? up on YouTube. Where do you live? I'm from New Jersey. Okay, Jersey. Okay. I'm from New Jersey. Okay, I won't hold that against yeah, you. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess sorry, um, go ahead. So, <laughs> so so along those lines, I've noticed um, recently uh, a lot of ceramic um, resistors going. Uh, you know, whole power section goes, ceramic resistor goes with it. I think the, the wire round ones. Um, are there any replacements or new advancements or should I look for new old stock on those? Well, it's funny because uh, uh, Paul, I think it was Paul and I were just talking about this, but wasn't it Paul, you sent me the FR401 uh, yes, picture? Did. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> so I'm sort of surprised um, at this because I kind of think, well, those are pretty much bulletproof, but hang on. But they get buku hot, don't they? They get pretty darn hot. And, and as a result, they do start to fail. 
Uh, Paul, though, I guess you're probably my most experienced guy in this regard. Are you seeing like many more ceramic wire wound failures than you used to? Uh, they're pretty sturdy resistor. N not too many, to be honest with you. Not too many. Not in the stuff I work on. I've seen two in the past month. I've got uh, a Cortex, one of those Imperial, I think it's Cortex Imperial clone. Yeah. Um, I think it's a five watt, uh, five ohm resistor. And then I was working on a uh, Sanyo EZB. I think that's a two watt, or I'm sorry, five watt, two ohm resistor. And both of them uh, complete, you know, open loop on them. Wow. Oh, I don't, I don't think open loop is the, is the correct. Peter says OL. It really means overload, meaning that okay. the resistance is higher than what you're set yeah. at. Yep. <laughs> just, to, just to let you know. Um, <coughs> well, fortunately, uh, resistors are the easiest of all things to test, aren't they? If it's bad, it's bad. If it tests good, it's good. It's not like a little capacitor where, man, you... Uh, I don't know. Is this good or bad? I'm just going to change the darn thing anyway. Um, so, so yeah, I, I guess I'm a little surprised. But then again, if you have something that's, you know, running at, you know, 80 degrees Celsius for 40 years, I, I think it might fail. So it doesn't, it doesn't totally surprise me. Uh, not really. Not really. Okay. And then in terms of replacements, Randy, just go with the same exact component or is there something new? No, no, same, same exact thing. Resistor? Same exact thing. I mean, you can well, always go around. up in, so you around. can always go up in, in dissipation, better known as wattage. You can always okay. go up in wattage. That's never an issue whatsoever. And in general, when I'm repairing something, if I've seen a common failure, the same component fails again and again, and there's a, a reasonable way for me to up the uh, up the specifications in some regard. I, I certainly will. Randy, yeah. Uh, from the stuff I work on, my experience, before the resistor fails, it'll burn up the traces and uh, just uh, open circuit for the ah, actual. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's entirely possible, or even melt the solder right off the thing. Yep. Yeah. You're absolutely. Right. That's exactly what I'm seeing with these. Yeah. So I think, um, but honestly, I think I'm going to leave the um, gee whiz, the thing is shorted. Let's, uh, how do I figure out the short? How do I disconnect everything? I'm going to think I'm going to leave that till next week and let's do that. Um, I, I just have some things that I just need to do and, and I'm going to go do them. Um, so uh, whoever it was that asked that, and I'll put this back on the message board on the Facebook group. Um, if we can be ready with a monitor with a with a short in it or something like that, that'd be groovy. If not, we can simulate it, and I'll I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Uh, does anybody have any more comments before I just kind of say goodbye for today? Hey, Randy, I know you want. Yeah, go ahead. So, Randy, I know you want to go. So maybe for another day, I would love to, if you could walk us through the schematics, specifically the video circuit. I, you know, every time I, I look at it, I see multiple train. Um, Tra transistors, I guess, and oh, I just yeah, easily. don't really understand how that works. Uh, yeah, that's easy to do. So, Anthony, can you do me a favor? Just drop me an email to uh, randyfrom at gmail.com, R-A-N-D-Y-F-R-O-M-M -M at gmail.com. Just say, hey, Anthony, Absolutely. go over a video next week, and we'll do that, and uh, that'd be cool for me. Appreciate it. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Keith, Thank you. you cool? Everybody cool? John yeah. uh, Sarinsky? <laughs> Sorry, we never even actually said hello. Hi. Hello. And, and John Cagney, nice to see you again. And everybody okay? Randy, right. if you want me to set up a monitor for next week, uh, what's yeah. the type of uh, 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 The question was about, you know, you have a shorted uh, horizontal output transistor, had, you know, disconnecting that putting a dummy load on it. Uh, do you have an incandescent lamp you use for dummy load? Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, that that's what I'd like to do, I think. Okay. Oh, and thanks for giving me the host back. I appreciate that, John. Uh, so that's all for today, I think. We'll just cut it short. And, and thanks very much, for, uh, everybody, for attending. Nice to meet you, uh, new folks. And Thank you. Uh, we'll do it again next week. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See ya.